Hello, and welcome to the Garden Glow Up podcast. My name is Amy, and today Ginny Steibold is our guest, and I'm so excited that she has agreed to do this. I'm a huge fan. Thank you so much, Ginny, for being here. And today, it's my pleasure. Wonderful. And today we're going to be talking about debunking, debunking gardening myths. So right. without further ado, let's jump into it. So which is your favorite gardening myth to debunk? Whoa, there's so many. Um, <laughs> we, we have been misled, I think, by a, a number of forces over the over the years. And that has created an un, unsustainable um, situation where where we're supposed to have our gardens be perfect and it should look like uh, the gardens around the castles in the in in the British Isles and if we go into a garden center they're going to sell us uh, flowers in full bloom and then we plant them and then they last for a couple of months and then we have to plant them again and there's a it's a good business model that we would buy plants over and over and over again but really that's not a sustainable way to go so we have been programmed in various ways and we'll talk about quite a few of these as we go through the uh, broadcast here today and um, you know with just some expectations of us as home gardeners that are totally unrealistic. Agreed. Uh, I really love gardening, but my garden looks messy on a day-to-day. -day. Well, maybe that's good. <laughs> yeah. Yes, and it is. You know, it, it's funny because it's kind of what you're talking about. Like, we've been programmed. I live in an HOA, and so you certainly don't want to get in trouble, um, but you have weeds coming up but you're like but the bees love them and you don't want to cut it but you know you're gonna have to um so that that is certainly happening i and it's hard you know when people see it and say oh but i thought you liked gardening it's like i do <laughs> but sometimes the messiness is part of it yes and and i'm i'm a big fan of uh native gardening and that uh, we should be planting more of what grows in our in our regions and a lot of the maintenance people are not aware of the natives right. um and we as gardeners i think one of the things that we can do is to make it look like we did this on purpose <laughs> and yes. so we, we plant natives but then we put a sign out saying that these natives are supporting uh, pollinators or we put signs out that saying we're not poisoning our yard because we have pets and children um, so the outreach is important but then just making the landscape a little bit neater so that you might have a mowed pathway through a meadow and a bench under a tree so it looks like it is a cared for landscape even though people might think that those natives are weeds Yes. Weeds. <laughs> I've been able, um, in the front of my house, I've been able to like hijack the system because I've done a hedge of native hibiscus. So it kind okay. of meets that like HOA, very um, landscaped look. But in my own way, I've incorporated natives um, and made it look, and it even looks formal, I would say. Um, so it, it looks very pleasing to the eye and civilized. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Civilized. That's a great word. <laughs> yes. So, and it certainly does. And then in the backyard where I have privacy and the HOA doesn't interfere, I've been able, like I said, things get a little bit more wild. They get a little bit more messy and I can get away with it. That's right. Yeah. And, and some of the other um, places where we have been programmed are, like the gardening programs on TV, and, and I don't have cable, so I don't watch them very regularly, um, but where the experts come in and they redo a whole landscape and the homeowner comes back and says, oh my gosh, it looks so beautiful. And that makes us think that landscaping is an event and not an ongoing process. And that is one of the problems that 
and then I have a neighbor who has that mentality who has instant landscapes and when it goes to pot then she does a whole nother instant landscape and probably spending thousands and thousands of dollars to do so and she brings in people and the plants all come in and then then something happens and you know it she has to take them out again or you know <laughs> so it's 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 an interesting um it's an interesting problem that we can that we can change by talking about this and that that's one of the reasons that i do programs like this so that we we can um help people overcome this so um i'm i'm surprised to hear you say that because i think when people are thinking about gardens because i find a lot of people just don't think about their landscaping at all maybe when they're selling a house in order to punch up the curb appeal. Um, but I find in, in my mind, or maybe in my circles, better said, I find that people don't really think about their landscaping at all. Like as long as the HOA isn't bothering them or something like that. So I'm surprised to hear you say that just because I think that people who typically like plants care for them to survive, you know, like, oh, okay, I did this work. And I want to put the right plant in the right place so that it stays. Um, but I, I understand what you're saying about the instant landscaping because I can't, I would back to that example of um, selling a house and wanting to punch up the curb appeal. Same thing. You're going to pay people to come and put a bunch of plants here so that instantly you have landscaping and the curb appeal is fixed and you can sell your house at a higher home value. Right. And it's, it's, you know, expectations of what a landscape is supposed to look like. And there are a number of things that, so we move into this house with the instant landscaping and there is a, a row of shrubs across the front of the house. And then there is a lone tree in the middle of the lawn. There are things that we can do for that, that landscape to make it more, um, more welcoming to birds and and pollinators like planting a grove around the tree and and um do you know widening the the curb the the foundation planting so that there's wildflowers in there as well but um one of the things that i wanted to talk about were some of the myths that go with the gardening that have been so widespread that they've become uh, truisms when they're actually false. And um, one, one of the topics is that talking about that lone tree in the middle of the lawn. So trees should have their root flare above the soil level so that you can see where the roots start to flare out. But a lot of times the trees are planted too deep. So we can go to that tree dig out the roots by hand because you don't want the the because they're often buried too deep and then the a lot of professional professional landscapers will mulch a tree right. with volcano mulching and they'll pile the mulch all the way up around the trunk and that is very bad for the tree because the mulch can uh, cause rotting of the trunk it can cause the tree to send out roots into that mulch and the mulch takes the water away from the roots and uh, can you know house mice and other critters that are in there that could chew at the tree so you would never have mulch that touches the trunk of the tree now you certainly can mulch around it keep the lawn away from it for one thing and the lawn mowers away from the tree so that the tree is not injured um but and and again i i would suggest strongly suggest putting bunching grasses and other trees and shrubs around the tree so that you end up with a, a little uh, oasis in the middle yeah. of the yard instead of that lone tree and that is healthier for the tree it is healthier for um i mean the the lawn and the tree do not get along together the lawn won't do well under the tree anyway um so you know it's 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 a good idea to 
take the lawn away from the tree and put other stuff around the tree. And then that tree grove will be more wind tolerant and the whole grove will be more drought tolerant. But the professional landscapers continue to do the volcano mulching. And that, <laughs> and that is, you know, just bad for the tree in many different ways. Yes. I'm going to um, keep coming back to the HOA just because I see the examples everywhere, but you, it, it's something that they do consistently. Like mulching is part of their job and they're like, okay, we're going to mulch every single tree in this neighborhood. And you always see the volcano. Um, so I see it all the time and I'm like, well, I can't go and save every tree, <laughs> but <laughs> you know, and dig out little moats around them. But it's something that you see absolutely all the time by right. people who are, caring for landscapes and trying to make them thrive. And so it's a disconnect, certainly. It is. It is. Yeah. Um, okay. So here's another, another topic. And that is that peat moss is a good gardening uh, additive. Uh, no, it's not. <laughs> okay, so peat moss is mined from in this in this country in northern Canada mostly, and it's made of sphagnum moss in a peat bog, and the peat increases in height one millimeter per year, so it's very slow growing. It can never be sustainably harvested, but even if it were. Peat moss is so acidic that it kills the microbes in the soil, which as gardeners we want. It's sterile. It's mm -hmm. too acidic. It's not good for our plants. It doesn't offer any nutrients. So most of the plants that are growing in peat bogs besides the sphagnum moss are carnivorous plants because they can't get enough, <laughs> they can't get enough nutrition from the peat. So we should not be adding peat moss. Oh to our landscape because it's not sustainable, it's not good for the soil, it's not good for the plants. It is sterile, but that is not going to make up for all the disadvantages if we think about the global environment. You don't want to use peat moss as an additive to our soil. Um, it's also uh, hydrophobic, which means uh, afraid of water. So if it dries out, the water will roll away and you would not have a very hard time getting it wetted again. So instead, you could use uh, core, coconut core, mm -hmm. or you, uh, you know, better yet, you could use compost that you make yourself. So I take my kitchen scraps and I take uh, weeds and everything, but not, not with the seeds, but uh, I create compost. And then I use that as my additive to my vegetable gardens. In my native gardens, I use very little additives because you want your native gardens to be nutrient poor because that's where the natives grow. They do not want a rich soil. So only in the vegetable gardens do you want to spend very much time and very much effort to enrich the soil. I'm so glad. I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt. I'm so glad you brought this one up because I've been doing a seed starting series specifically for vegetables. And I had already known this about peat moss. Um, but it seems like if you go to find seed starter anywhere, even at local nurseries where professionals are looking after, everybody is using peat moss. And so I did exactly what you said. Um, I have my own compost, but it's very um, thick. So there's a local vendor that sells it um, and, and it's extremely fine. So I've been starting all my seeds in the compost and my germination rate was wonderful. There's, there's no real need for the peat moss. Mm -hmm. um, and everything that you mentioned sounds exactly like my experience. The, the compost actually feeds the seeds. You don't really have to have any additives or anything. And everything went over really, really well. Um, and so I, I just kind of strayed from it. I don't have all the background that you had. So I never really talked about it. I was like, I know we're not supposed to. So I just went the other direction, but I'm so glad that you brought this one up. Right. It's, it's, um, 
it's something that again i mean my mother bought a bale of peat moss every year to put in mm -hmm. her tomato beds and it's been a tradition a garden tradition for you know decades and but it's not sustainable peat moss sequesters a lot of carbon so it's not good for the planet f to harvest that peat moss but in our own gardens it's not good for the plants either all right and here, here's another um, thing if we want to talk about uh, trees and shrubs and giving them the best start. Again, when we plant a tree, hopefully a native tree, but even if it's not, uh, if it's a fruit tree, if you're doing a food forest or something like that, if you are buying a container grown tree, what would happen in that is, especially if it's a large one, you, you would want to do small ones, but um, if it's a large tree, it's been kept in that container for too long and the roots are winding around inside the container. And in order to keep the tree alive, the people who are growing the tree are put in fertilizer balls and all kinds of very rich uh, additives into that container so the tree can survive but when you plant it in your yard in the lousy soil in your yard you want to get rid of all that rich growing medium you want to rinse the roots of the tree and you want to correct the circling roots so that the tree doesn't choke itself mm -hmm. over years. I mean, it might take 20 years for the tree to choke itself, but why not spread the roots out so that they go out, they would become more drought tolerant and more wind tolerant if you have roots that are spread out. So this is tough love for a tree um, that you would rinse the roots, straighten out the roots, you know, and but you spread them out, have no additives in the planting hole at all. So it's just your lousy soil. Mm -hmm. And the tree will have to get used to that quickly. Now, this is hard on the tree because it will lose all its root hairs. And so what you would need to do is do a lot of irrigation and you would build mm -hmm. a, a um, mound around the tr planting hole so that when you're watering it every day to get it, um, uh, keep it irrigated so it doesn't wilt, then you would want the water to stay in the planting hole. Now, if you if you really want to enrich the soil, you can entice the roots to go out by putting compost outside the planting hole on top of the soil. Oh, so that sounds that, like a good idea. So that you wouldn't, the, so the rich soil would be outside the planting hole and you would not dig it in. You could put mulch on right. it, but do not dig it in. And then if you want to do it again, then the next circle of compost around that planting hole would be a little bit farther out and then a little bit farther out. So you might want two or three treatments to enrich the soil outside the planting hole so that the trees root, the tree roots will go out of the planting hole and not stay in the planting hole. And there, there's a, a a group that is promoting that if you dig square holes that it's better for the tree no <laughs> oh no <laughs> okay no no you'd want a round hole okay um, not a square hole um, <laughs> i had heard that it never i mean i never really <laughs> thought about it too much but i have heard that one yeah i mean it, the the mis there's misinformation and there's disinformation so the misinformation is the square hole because you're not trying to sell anything but you know I've, I've, mm. I've talked about this several times but there are people who are have sponsors named right. you know big name gardeners they have sponsors that might sell additives <laughs> and so they are saying oh you know add add my my uh, additive to that hole so that the tree will grow, but they're making money from being a sponsor. Okay. So no additives, no additives, because that, I, that I think is disinformation. Okay. I think there's a little baby myth in what you said. I've been reading your book and you touched on it in the book. And, well, I know you have several books. I've been reading Maintaining a Florida Native Landscape. And so you kind of touched on it and it was that I thought you always want the biggest plant that you can afford. Mm 
Right. And in the book, you said, no, not really. No, no. <laughs> it's not necessarily healthier. Um, maybe getting like a plant that's not quite a seedling, but not quite grown, just getting something in its adolescence is probably best. And that it'll catch up to the bigger plant because the roots are actually healthier. So correct. I, if correct me if I misunderstood this, but when you catch a plant before its roots have had the chance to um, coil, um, it's healthier. So if you put it in the ground, then because it's a healthier plant, it'll even catch up to the bigger plant. I think you said. Correct. So, so it's much, I mean, I think in terms of gardening mist, I don't, nobody necessarily ever told me that. I think when you're working in the garden, that's what you think to yourself, like, oh, the bigger the plant I can get, the better, just because you want your garden to have that manicured look as soon as possible. Um, and to have the plants really mature as soon as possible. Yeah, may, may, it, it'll make a statement. So if you plant a big tree, right. I mean, and it is often repeated. I've heard it many times that, you know, buy the biggest plants you can afford. No, you won't, you don't want to do that. Save your money. Mm -hmm. Buy a small plant that's only two or three years old that has not been topped, that has not been held in a container for years too long. And it, again, it will, it will establish itself much quicker you will save money yes mm -hmm. you will need to plant other stuff around it while you're waiting for it to grow so it will yeah. take a little bit of time to come to the size that you are looking for um, but it, when you buy smaller trees and this goes for shrubs as well but uh, but particularly trees if you buy smaller trees then while you're waiting for them to grow you would plant something temporary around it like bunching grasses or mm -hmm. wildflowers or ground covers around it that once the tree starts putting out shade will have to be replaced with other stuff um, mm -hmm. that would be able to withstand the shade um, but yes yeah, don't don't buy the biggest plant uh, save your money buy more plants buy smaller right. plants buy ones that are going to survive and have a greater mm -hmm greater potential for surviving of course there, there is no guarantee but have you know let, let's increase our probabilities absolutely that and i think that like you said save your and if you want to make an impact i think it's just a matter of making that adjustment like okay if i'm going to go get adolescent plants but i'm saving money because i didn't get the biggest tree or whatever plant and then you you can start to think to yourself okay maybe the impact is more about the volume you know so like you said you didn't buy one big one you bought five medium to smallish ones and then do it that way and then the garden overall will be healthier than if you had just gotten one huge thing uh one huge tree and yeah. attempted it that way right and and one thing you can do if you're in a real hurry for um screening or something is to install trellises and vines while you're waiting for the trees to grow so that that way you have something that's big in the garden right now and the vines will go up in a year and will you know climb up to you know 10 15 feet and that way you have your your screening mm -hmm. and and the vine will probably be shaded out when the trees grow larger but or you can plan ahead and plant plant the vine in a pot so that you can you can move it later so right. that um you you plan ahead for for that but that way you can make a big statement right away um without buying a tree that's too old Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's an interesting situation. Um, and the other, the other part of that maintenance is again, if you're in an HOA or even if you're not, if you, everybody's got some kind of neighbors is the mm -hmm. outreach so that you end up having something that looks like you planned it. So if you have a wildflower garden, put something neat around the edges, a bunching grasses, small bunching grasses, or, or something that looks like a border. So that behind it, 
it can be in disarray. It could be, you know, all your all your pollinator plants and everything like that. But if you have a nice, relatively neat border that you've that the neighbors would say, oh, look, she's got a neat border there. She is actually trying to do this correctly. Agreed. And I've seen that a lot. If if you look at um, you had mentioned British gardens. This is something that they're experimenting with a lot and they just do such a good job of exactly what you're talking about. The wildflower beds with the nice little border and it really makes it look intentional, which Correct. somehow just switches how you react to these things. You just look at it and think like, oh, wow, that looks so nice. Um, so I, I think you're right on the money. Right. And the, the other thing that you can add to a um, to your landscape, especially at the beginning when things are small, are containers. So that you you can, you know, have an usually an odd number of containers that have something spectacular in the container, some big wildflower or some bunching grass or something, and then you can move that away later. Mm -hmm. And so that you you would end up having containers that would be a movable, a movable garden that, that you could do. And speaking of containers, here is one real myth that was shown a hundred years ago that putting gravel in the bottom of a container does not increase drainage does not help with the drainage because gravel in the bottom of the pot would bring the wet soil closer to the top. And so you would want to have, you want good drainage in, in, a, in a container, you want a taller, a taller container filled with soil only with some pine needles or leaves on the bottom, no gravel um, because the gravel will actually caused the soil to be wetter farther up. And it was shown a hundred years ago that having the gravel there um, changes the dynamic of the water flow. A water wants to stick together. It adheres to itself. Mm -hmm. Each water molecule is like a little magnet. And so the water is not going to go into the gravel until the soil is completely soaked. And oh, wow. so, and so, knowing about the the water structure is is what what happens there. You need need to have a little bit of science in there. But again, it was shown a hundred years ago that that was well, not, and that was not going to help with the drainage. And the other thing is is that because now indoor plants are obviously all the rage. They were huge during the pandemic. And I think one of the things you realize when you're dealing with indoor plants is that you don't actually want them to be heavy because the heaviness just means that every time you have to do a little bit of maintenance, it's going to be quite a workout. And you're like, it's just the weekly watering. So I think that's really important to um, know if you if you enjoy your indoor plants, that the, the gravel at the bottom is not going to help. Not only is it not going to help the plant, then you're setting your, like you're making your life much harder yeah, in the it's process. Gonna be hev it's going to be heavier. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. So if you, if you want to lighten up the um, soil a bit, then you would put more pine needles and more leaves in the bottom. And, I like that know, one. Yeah. All right. And, um, as far as the as the other kinds of things that I wanted to talk about was that um, Spanish moss and mistletoe do not have to be removed from trees. Okay. Okay. So Spanish moss and and the tree guys who can make money removing them for you uh, say, oh yeah, they, yeah, but. Spanish moss is a flowering plant. It's not a moss. It's not Spanish. It's native to the, <laughs> to the southeastern states. Yes. It's, it's in the pineapple family, in the bromeliad family. And so it has little tiny flowers, and mm -hmm. it makes its living by cleaning the air. So it doesn't take nutrients from the trees on which it is um, found itself. 
and it cleans the air while it's there. It, uh, it is a pollinator plant and, and you do not need to remove it. However, if it does fall, that Spanish moss does make good mulch. <laughs> if, if it oh, does, does fall. Oh, does it really? Oh, sure, because it, it's, um, it, it sticks together and, and, and it, it is a good mulch, but you do not need to remove it. It does not kill trees. It will find itself on bare trees because there's more light. I mean, it's a photosynthesizing right. plant. And so people will see it and they often think lichen is also causing their trees to die because the trees without the leaves have the lichen on it and the, and the Spanish moss on it. And it's a symptom, not a cause. Yeah. The, the other thing that we have here um, is mistletoe. And mistletoe also does not need to be removed. It's actually a, a keystone plant in our ecosystems. Um, and yes, it is partially parasitic so that it, it sends its rootlets, which are called haustoria, into the tree where mm -hmm. it, it, is, it is, finds itself. And then that, that um, plant, the mistletoe plant, will take some of the water that's in the xylem of the plant and use it for itself. But it is photosynthesizing, so the thought is that it also shares the sugars that it creates with its host plant. And one of the things to know is that the water that is soaked up into a tree, 90% of that water evaporates into the air. Mm -hmm. And the small amount that would be used by the mistletoe, even if there are mm. several clumps, is not going to make that much difference because 90% of it goes into the air anyway. Right. Um, so the mistletoe does not have to be removed. It is the so only larval food for the great, uh, the great purple hair streak butterfly. Mm -hmm. and, and it has berries at this time of year. I took a photo, I put it on Facebook, of, of uh, got up the stepladder and went up into a small live oak in my yard that had a mistletoe that wasn't too high. It was Thank higher you. higher than I could take the picture from the ground. Right. But so I took the step ladder out and took a, a photo of it. And right now it has it's filled with berries. Can you think of anything else that's got berries right now? No. Because you know, it's, you know so it's offering yeah. berries to the migrating birds like the cedar waxwings that need to gorge themselves to get ready to migrate back to their nesting areas in the spring. I think I'm too far south to really experience mistletoe. I see Spanish moss and that I kind of know. I don't know if we have mistletoe this far south. I, I don't even know if I would, I like if I saw it, if I would know what I was looking at. Um, you do have it. Yeah. There, oh, do there's, we? Yeah. And there is another in farther south, there's a mahogany mistletoe as well. Ooh. I need to look those up. Yeah. So the, the mahogany mistletoe, I don't have up here in North Florida. Um, mm -hmm. But um, yeah, the, the Eastern mistletoe or the Oak mistletoe, I think is, mo is, is distributed through most of Florida and actually most of the Eastern U S it doesn't go up much past New Jersey, I think is how far North it goes, but there is the Southern mistletoe as well and then there's mistletoes out in the west that and and we were camping in 2022 uh, just to get out and do something and mm -hmm. i saw some cedar mistletoe out west that i'd never seen before so there are various types of of mistletoes that um, are partially parasitic so that they suck the water out but they photosynthesize so they're not mm -hmm. totally parasitic but anyway it does not need to be removed and neither does the spanish moss good to know okay 
All right, so here's a, here's another myth, and um, I had experience with this fairly recently, um, is that people recommend that if there are pests in your landscape, that you would spray them with soap, mm -hmm. insecticidal soap. No, you don't want to do that because any terrestrial plants have a waxy cuticle that protects the plants from the aphids, protects it from desiccation, and from from the sun, um, and also other fungus funguses that may try to attack the leaves. And so if you spray soap, no matter how mild it is, that you are going to start destroying the waxy cuticle on that leaf. So you never want to spray soap on a plant, never. And yeah. it, it's, um, you want, you want to, and, and in, in some cases you, you would want to call for the ladybugs if you've got too many aphids on your plants. But even, even if they're, you think you have to do something, rinse them off with water because mm -hmm. then you're not going to kill the, the, predators of the aphids like ladybug larvae and and other lace wings and other pre predators that would kill those um consume those aphids mm -hmm. if you spray soap you're going to kill everything so that yes. you you were actually sending the sending that ecosystem out of whack so no soap no and i know that a lot of I, I'm surprised that people talk about pests. I, I kind of understand in the vegetable garden and wanting to make sure you can kind of get your veggies. But right. in terms of what I would call like ornamental landscaping, even if yep. it's native or, or whatever the case is, I love seeing all the bugs. And my kids do too. And we run out. And even when there's caterpillars and they're like destroying, like, you know, sometimes they collect on a plant and they just kind of eat the whole thing. One, the plant always is fine. Like a, a week later, it grows back all its leaves. Everything is fine. But then it's also, if you've taken the time to cultivate a garden, it is so much fun to see all the wildlife that it invites into the garden, because it's not just that bug. Then eventually the birds that eat that bug come. Um, and so that's how you really cultivate an ecosystem is by letting Correct. those bugs do whatever they were about to do or pests yeah. do whatever they were about to do. And then it just sets off a chain reaction. That's truly amazing to see. Right. You know, Doug Tallamy has done a lot of research. Now he he's in Delaware. He's not in Florida. Okay. So he he um, and his student studied um, uh, chickadees. And so one pair of chickadees needs six thousand to nine thousand caterpillars to raise one clutch of young. So they lay five or six eggs in their nest. And in order to get them to fledging stage, they need all those caterpillars to feed to their young because the caterpillars are full of protein. They don't have bones. They don't have skin. You know, they're, 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 they don't have undigestible parts so that this is the ideal food for a baby bird. Mm -hmm. And so if you, if <laughs> the saying goes that if nothing is eating your plants, then your yard is not part of the local ecosystem. So a real butterfly gardener cheers when something is eating the plants. Yes. And that's what makes it fun. <laughs> I uh, ab absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> so yeah, and in a in a vegetable garden though, I do use BT if I've get mm -hmm. if I've gotten bug um, with caterpillars on my melons or something like right. that and I was buying a, a small uh, concentrated bottle of BT in a in a big box store a couple of months ago actually it was last year and the person who was in there was very helpful and said oh you should add soap to that and I said 
oh no <laughs> no no you don't you don't want to add soap i'm a botanist i can tell you that you don't want to. i know you're trying to help but no you don't add soap to the... no. <laughs> don't say that to anybody else <laughs> <laughs> yeah she probably said oh my god <laughs> but she was just trying to be helpful but that right. is that is a myth that is very hard to um get rid of that and and many people are doing it and so where do the myths come from i mean i i i in researching a presentation that i have on uh, debunking the garden myths i looked at a recent farmer's almanac mm -hmm. and the the writer was a creative writer. She was not a botanist. She was not okay. a master gardener. She was a writer. <laughs> and she, the stuff that she made up was lame. And, you know, it was ridiculous stories that she was telling. And then I found, you know, I quoted some of, I looked up quotes from that farmer's almanac and saw that it was repeated in other documents by other people. And so <laughs> the, people are making stuff up mm -hmm. and then, you know, they're saying they're a good source. Right. When they're not. Right. Like I said, a lot of the professionals in my area are using the peat moss, Yeah. you know, and you just have to, you know, okay. And then just go do your thing. That's why I did my seed starting series. I recommend you do it with compost. And, right. you know, you do your best to, to spread the word. That's right. And companion planting, if we're talking about vegetables, mm -hmm. uh, is another one where there are certainly a lot of good scientifically based companion planting. But then there is ridiculous um, companion planting stories that don't make any sense at all. And okay. so one that has been repeated over and over and over again is that you would plant cucumbers next to your sunflowers Ooh. so that the cucumbers would grow up them. But sunflowers oh. are aliopathic, which means that they have an herbicide that kills neighboring plants. So you do not want to plant anything <laughs> near a sunflower that you want. Right. So you plant you sunflowers are great near a vegetable garden, but near is the word there. You okay. don't you want them off by themselves and not in the vegetable garden because they will they will inhibit the plant growth. So you do not want to grow cucumbers next to your sunflower, even though the cucumbers could climb up the sunflower. Um, if you've ever had a bird feeder where you had sunflower seeds underneath that bird feeder nothing grows it, oh. it it ends up being totally dead space under a sunflower bird feeder because of that aliopathic property that is so interesting yeah so there there but there are there are companion plantings that do work and you do want to do crop rotations so you're not growing the same thing every year season after season right. in the same bed so you would t have a group of plants that you would want to plant one year in this bed and then the next year you plant them in the next bed and in that bed you would plant a whole different kind so you would do it by plant family and family groups so that you you would end up with the legumes being a big part of that because the legumes uh, will fix nitrogen and, and enrich mm -hmm. the soil. So you would have the legumes in one in one area that you would uh, rotate around. Um, but if you have legumes, you don't want to fertilize them too much because if they've got too much nitrogen, they'll grow more leaves and not as much fruit. Okay. <laughs> so there, there's all kinds of uh, ways around it, but there, there are, there are ways to to have smart companion planting um, that not only makes sense but is also scientifically based. Do you have an exact? I'm so curious because I had always heard that the science around, um, I guess what you would call some of the myths around 
companion planting was shoddy. Like, it, like the science wasn't really there to back it up. So I've always just kind of dismissed it. I've never really thought too much in my vegetable beds as to like what to put together and whatnot. Um, so do you have any examples of when it does work? Okay, so um, there, are, there are a number of things that you want to do. So one, one is that you want to have natural, um, natural predators in your garden. Mm -hmm. So sweet alyssum will attract some of the predators to their tiny little white flowers. And so you would you would plant some sweet alyssum, and they, that ah. would end up that would end up um, being uh, an attractant to uh, those little wasps that lay their eggs on the caterpillars. Yes. Um, that, but they need a tiny little flower like the sweet alyssum. Okay. So so and having marigolds around your plants will also attract attract pollinators and you want to have not huge swaths of the same plant but you would want to mix it up so mm -hmm. that you have some of it here and some of it over here so that um, the enemies of the of that plant don't have it easy that they have to work a little harder to find their stuff and one of the reasons that you would want sunflowers near your vegetable garden is because it's a trap plant so there's going to be some of the um insects are tra are attracted to the sunflower over your crops and so that it would reduce the the crops um, and there there's other there's other ideas where there are trap crops um, where there's yes. one type of squash that you would plant first and then all the squash bugs are attracted to that mm -hmm. one over all the other ones. And so it would end up being uh, a trap plant. Right. So, yeah, there's a there's a lot of that. There's a book now on companion planting and also Linda Chalker Scott has uh, um, a, uh, a good... Um, summary of companion planting so okay. the, the companion planting book is by jessica walliser that's on science-based companion planting uh, i did a book review on that on my blog Ooh, wonderful so i'll check that out it's there and I, I'm, ty I'm typing the name as you talk <laughs> right and linda chalker scott has an amazing website she's in washington state and she has a website called informedgardener.com, mm. which is the busting of all kinds of horticultural myths, all kinds, including the rocks in the bottom of the, of right. the pot, the rinsing of the roots, and um, that kind of thing. Um, so that she has a huge amount of information there on science-based gardening. So informedgardener.com. I love that. So I have a question. What would you do if you found a weed that you didn't want in the garden? What kind of garden? <laughs> it's a vegetable garden. I would pull it out. But if okay. it's a native garden, unless I knew what the weed was and I knew it was invasive or something like that, I would probably leave it. Okay. Okay. And of course, the, what is the definition of a weed? There's many native plants that I would call weeds because they're so aggressive, right. um, but they also serve a purpose in the local mm -hmm. ecosystem. So it depends. But in my native areas, I'm much more likely to allow the weeds to grow unless I know it's an invasive plant like coral right. ardesia or or climbing ferns or or, or so, something that I know is um, invasive mm -hmm. I'm inclined to let it stay agreed <laughs> um, how do you feel so if somebody does find a plant that they don't want um, would vinegar and salt be one of the things you might use to get rid of that plant 
only if it's in cracks in between in your ah. in your driveway. Only if it's in a place that you never want plants to grow. <laughs> okay. Um, because if you salt the earth and you acidify the earth with vinegar and salt, then nothing is going to do well there. So if you have a pile of weeds maybe underneath your deck and you spray it with vinegar mm -hmm. and salt and a homemade weed killer, you're going to kill all the toads that are in there. You're going to kill the earthworms. You're going to kill all the good um, um, bugs that are in there as well as maybe not doing such a great job on killing the weeds. And so, yeah, vinegar and salt is never called for in a, in a in a garden unless it is in a crack in your driveway that you never want right. anything to grow right um, and so that it, it's fine there but otherwise no okay <laughs> got it all right so are there did we go through all the myths um i think so and you know um you have to keep an open mind in a garden because you have to listen to your garden as well. Mm -hmm. The garden will teach us as gardeners lessons and, and every day there are things to learn from the garden. Um, but yeah, I, th I think we've gone through a number of them and, and you know, there's some things for people to think about. Absolutely. And if you have any thoughts, if you have any questions to all the listeners out there, feel free to drop them in the description box below. We'd love to continue the conversation with you. And if you have any questions like, hey, I heard this once or whatever the case may be, that's a great place to leave the questions. Maybe one day it might be the topic of a new YouTube video. So go ahead and leave that down there. Um, at this point, I'd like to thank Ginny so much for joining us. I am on a mission to read all of your books, and I think everybody out there should as well. Um, is there anything that, you'd, that you're working on that you'd like to let the listeners know? Well, yes, yeah, so I'm, I'm working on the seventh book now. It's on Living Shorelines. It's out for peer review. So in about a year, depending, we, we may get that. But I, I do have one uh, good deal for people, um, mm -hmm. and that is that our Climate Wise Landscaping book is now in its second edition. But there are some first editions left. And if you go to the climatewiselandscaping.com website, which is our website, you can buy the book for half price. That's a great deal. Yeah. And so gar gardening with a climate in mind is also a yeah. whole different way of thinking uh, mm -hmm. about gardening. So you save water as a good gardener, but when you're a climate wise gardener, you save water to not only save the water, but also to save the energy that's used to get the water to our taps. So mm -hmm. you, it's a rethinking uh, the gardening entirely, but it is on half price right now. Um, climatewisegardening.com. Perfect. Okay. So I'll be, leave, we'll be putting links in the description box below. So if you're looking for the book, if you'd like to connect with Ginny, she has a blog, she has a website. We're going to be putting all of those links in the description box below. So you can just go find all the information there. I've also recently become an Amazon influencer. So some of the tools you may need in the garden will be in links below. So I'll go ahead and plug that as well in the description box so that if you're looking for something you need, you can find it there. Um, but other, I think that's it. Thank you okay. so much, Jenny, for joining us. It's my pleasure. Thanks. Okay. Well, I hope to see you all here next month when we have our ne next speaker. So go ahead and subscribe and we'll see you soon, hopefully. All right. Bye. Okay.